not just for us at Vogue, but for the industry in Mexico in general. We've done something that no one has ever done. When I first arrived at the magazine, I just felt like I wasn't seeing those women on any covers in the US or around the world. So it kind of felt like it was my responsibility in a way to give them a voice. And in 2019, we put Yalitza Aparicio on the cover. And that was really important because I remember an entertainment director at the time saying to me, oh, you have to do something with Roma. And I said, yes, we're working on it. We're gonna do a cover with the cast. And she said, oh, you would never Never put your leads on the cover. And I kind of thought to myself, why not? And I knew what she was trying to say without saying it. I thought to myself, how does this woman know what will work for Mexico and what won't work for Mexico? And I immediately called our culture editor at the time and I said, we need to shoot Yalitza and please put her on exclusive until January and the cover comes out. Make sure she doesn't come out anywhere else. And, and it came out in December and I'll never forget, I saw my Instagram blow up by just the first picture. It wasn't even the cover that we released at the time. And it was completely, you know, I would say there was a before and after, not just for us, at Vogue, but for the industry in Mexico in general. I think it, it spoke to indigenous women around the world, not just Mexico. I think it was 2015 when I moved down here. You know, I worked for Edward Enfield at the time, and I remember I told Edward, I said, Edward, don't tell anyone that I'm leaving in January. And literally, I think not even three hours after I told him, I had an email from Jonathan New. <laughs> He had contacted the woman that worked in Mexico and she emailed me. She said, let me know when you're ready and come down and when you're settled. And I went to my interview in November. And so I wore this like Peter Pomodo wet overcoat that I'll never get rid of it because I it has like such sentimental value for me. And they said there was a job. They couldn't tell me what the job was. So in January, they called me with my job offer, which was to be the editor in chief of both Mexico and Latin America was the dream come true. I remember Lazaro Hernandez from Friends of Schooler was like, oh, you're gonna move to Mexico and work for Mexico. And I was like, well, you know, in my dreams. And then he's like, it's kind of like I manifested it for me. So I think some of the covers that we've done with these amazing women have been one of my favorite parts of my job and what we've done at Vogue Mexico and Latin America. And I remember finally getting, for example, Linacy for the September 2017 cover. And that cover was amazing because Linacy wore her natural early Afro hair. And Linacy's from Dominican Republic where most women burn their scalps every month to get their hair straight. So I remember Linacy coming up to me and saying, Carla, thank you so much for putting me on the cover. You have no idea the response I've gotten from young girls that you can wear your Afro curly hair on the cover of Vogue. I said, this has to be something that we are, we're continuing to do. If I'm not supporting these girls, who is? And so, you know, I think it was important to us to really show the diversity of the region to show, you know, the different types of beauty in Latin America. And I remember being pitched Camila Cabello, who at the time had just come out with the Havana song. And I said, let's do it. We did it in March, 2018. And it was the most engagement we had got for any cover since Linazi. And I said, this is the way we have to go. There's so much Latin talent coming up. Let's do it. Let's, let's go in that direction. I think people were so excited to see Yalitza on the cover and something that they had never seen before, even in Mexico. And I remember my friend Audrey, who I mentioned as a mentor, sent me a message that said, thank you for putting someone who looks like me on the cover. And that felt really important because I said, okay, if I resign the next day, it was like mission accomplished. I remember always like buying Harper's and Vogue and W in newspaper form. And then finally W in like the big form. And I started calling the designer numbers that were there, just asking if they were looking for interns. And this girl answered and she said, oh, where are you calling from? And I said, Tucson. And she said, oh, I'm from Tucson. And I never have anyone from Tucson call. Are you interested in doing an internship? And I said, yes. And so I flew to New York and I got the job. I stayed at my mom's friend's daughter's couch on Broadway and like 73rd Street. And I got the internship and I interned at AFS showroom that summer. And they said, Carla, we need help in PR because there's no one down there today. Someone coming from W, she's here to pull red dresses for a shoot. And I was like, 
someone has that job, tell me more. And so I went and helped her pull some dresses and kind of did her memo note. And in my natural, very curious state, I asked her what she did and she was telling me a little bit about it. And I was like, okay, next summer, this is what I want to do. So I called W the following summer and I flew to New York and interviewed and met Stella Angelakos, who later went to Condé Nast and she hired me as an intern. So that's where I got my foot first in the door and that what made me decide that I wanted to continue on my path. I started working at Mademoiselle magazine and I met Bonnie Morrison there, not only a good friend, but a good mentor and someone who can give you sound advice, which I always look for. And then I went to work for Elle. I worked for Nina Garcia for almost a year. And then my friend Gareen Zarunian called me and said, do you want to interview at Vogue? They've been through three assistants. Do you want me to put your name in? And I said, of course. I got the job. I started working for Virginia after Wendy left. And I think it was so inspiring to see all the different women that worked at Vogue. I mean, it was predominantly women. And then after I worked at Vogue, I went to work for the New York Times for Stefano Tonki, who had just started at T. And it was kind of my first adult job, I want to say. It was a director role. Um, I worked for Anne Christensen, who was also just an amazing role model. She was an amazing boss, and she really stood up for her team. I was the fashion market director. And it was an amazing school because I really got to see this kind of idea of lifestyle, which I think at the time there weren't so many brands talking about lifestyle and Anne really helped guide me through that magazine. Then I would also say that another mentor is Ricky Desole, who was actually my intern at Vogue and then later became the PR manager at Prada. She's someone that I really count on for sound advice. I think she's incredibly creative, but also has a real acumen for business and I really admire her. Um, some of the challenges were people even had no idea that it's both Mexico and Latin America. So they're two different issues and with two different closing times, two different versions of Spanish in a way, you know, we close one issue and then we change certain words, which people, you know, aren't even aware of, you know, just like the cultural differences that half of Latin America is in winter and that Mexico is in full blown summers. So that was one of the biggest challenges and also the budgets in Mexico were nowhere near what they were in New York and the team of people, I mean at W I was managing a team of 10 people only in fashion. When I arrived at the magazine I think we were 15 total so it was learning to work with a smaller team. The size and dimension of Latin America and the cultural differences, I think people really underestimate them. I remember once being at the shows in Milan and someone said to me, oh, um, you do two magazines. And Jonathan Newhouse said, two magazines with one budget. And so that was really interesting. And I think we've done a really great job of you know, differentiating them and being aware that there are so many cultural differences in the territory. And the second challenge is that people's perception of, of Mexico and Latin America, I would say in 2015 has drastically changed. You know, at first it was a struggle to get photographers, to get models, when we would say, okay, we have this model. And they would say, oh, but the photographers, eh, they haven't worked with enough models. And it's like, well, they haven't worked with enough models because you're not giving them the model. So it's kind of, it was a, a lot of, you know, going back and forth and really saying, okay, these are my budgets. So what's the next level of photographers that we want to move up? And for that, I have a back and forth a lot. And I worked at interview with Fabian Barron and Carl Templer and a lot. I love what they did with the magazine because he gave me such good advice. And he said, what do you want your Vogue to be? Italian Vogue is this, French Vogue is this. American Vogue is this, what is Vogue Mexico and what is Latin America? So that made me, you know, question of who we wanted to work with, what we wanted people to see. And so we started working with different photographers and started working with, you know, people like Chris Coles, who never shot a Vogue cover, who shot his first Vogue cover for us with Carly Kloss. And who do we want to nurture? And I think that was very important because for people to turn around and say, oh, they're doing great things. They're working with young people, you know, the world's changed so much since then. The region is important, the consumer is important, and you need to be paying attention. I think that was also a big challenge. I am really excited about 
a lot of different Latin designers. You know, Mexican designer Francisco Cancino. I love Lorena Sarabia. I think they're all doing great things. Sandra Veil, who's Peruvian but lives in Mexico. Aurelia Bags, I think are great that are designed Torres Sisters. I think in terms of Latino designers that are doing amazing things and closing things like New York Fashion Week are Raul Lopez for Duar, which I think is a really big statement that, you know, New York Fashion Week is being closed by a relatively young designer who also is from Dominican Republic and grew up in, in New York and really is in touch with his Dominican roots. Um, people like Willie Chavaria, Mexican-American living in LA. I think the fact that those two shows are kind of closing the week is something really exciting um, for Latinos and I think really inspiring for those designers in Mexico and in Colombia. Say like one day I'm gonna close New York Fashion Week and they're closer to that goal by seeing two designers are doing it. When I think back to the Dior show and you know the importance of Dior coming to Mexico and doing it like the way they did it in particular, I've spent time with Maria Grazia, I spent time with the people from Dior pre-show and she really truly has a love and appreciation for Mexico. I think it was important for her to come work with artisans. The cast was so important to her and the team. There were models, I think there were over 30 Mexican models. There were models from Colombia, there were models from Dominican Republic, there were models from Brazil. And people will say, oh, why not all Mexican models? Well, I also think Mexico is really kind of a leaping point to the rest of Latin America. You know, we are one of the markets that sells more luxury at this point. I think it really puts Mexico on the cultural map in a way that it had not. And let's face it, you know, a lot of people that will buy the dress mocked by the designer of Rocinante Narci in collaboration with Dior might never come to Mexico and might never go to Oaxaca and buy a dress at Narci store. So the fact that they now have this global platform, I think is really important. When I moved here in 2015, it was an interesting time, I think, politically. Donald Trump came to office. You heard all this kind of rhetoric about, you know, Mexicans, and there was kind of a lot of negative press. For the first time, Mexicans were like, hey, that's wrong. My impression was that people really started to see, let's buy things here, let's do things here, let's start supporting the brands that are taking the initiative to come and open here. I think that, you know, when you think about how to make a brand and one of our challenges in Vogue Mexico is to remain aspirational, but at the same time, embracing diversity. I feel like the definition of luxury in itself is, has changed so much, right? Personally, like when I think of luxury, I do think of handmade things that are made, for example, by Perla Valtierra, her beautiful pottery. You can be aspirational without having to cost a million dollars. And that has changed and it tells you a lot about the world that we're living in. People really want to see people that they can identify with. And I think that is aspirational with, without having to be expensive in a way. I think the conversation for Vogue Mexico and Latin America regarding sustainability is know where your clothes is coming from. I think it's so important. I think here in Mexico, um, it's been really interesting to do spaces like Espacio Vogue where young designers come and sell their pieces in Miami or here in Mexico City because we're seeing that a lot of the brands are already using recycled fabrics. We're using cactus, which is native to Mexico. You know, we really want to highlight the people of our region that are working sustainably and are doing things with fabrics that are innovative and at the same time good for the environment. But I would say um, some of my favorite neighborhoods are San Miguel Chapultepec. I now live in Polanco, which I love because you can walk around. I love so many different parts of Mexico City. I love going to a restaurant called Nico's that's in Azcapotzalco. I love going to Coyacan and San Angel. I love that if you drive half an hour away, you can be in a forest and the temperature is completely different. And I, I think that to me is kind of what sums up Mexico is so many different colors and like senses, right? All in one big metropolis. But I don't think that the conversation of diversity and inclusion is in any way something that's a trend or should be a trend or just one season, right? I think it's something that we have to think about as a platform like Vogue every single day. So it can't be something that we think about seasonally, right? Because I think in order for things to really change, it has to be a conversation that has to be continuously happening. When you think of, of Mexico, you know, I want people to think of happiness, of laughter, of drinks, of food, being at a restaurant where you run into people and then your table turns into a table of eight. I think that's something that really 
representative of not just of Mexico City, but of Mexico, the country in general. Growing up in a family of four, coming to see my parents' family all the time, and there were always these tables of people I had no idea who they were, and then by the end of lunch, you were best friends, you know? So it's that sense of community, it's that sobre mesa that I think really makes Mexico special. <laughs> it's because I talked about it. <laughs>